Welcome, everybody, to Calvary Chapel Friday night U-Turn for Christ service. <laughs> All right. What a blessing it is to be with you guys here tonight. And uh, it wasn't hard to come up with a study when my birthday's April Fool's Day. So, uh, oh, man. And uh, much of my family, I believe, is watching. And uh, I've had many rough birthdays. And I did not like my birthday too much until I read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Go ahead and turn there, if you would, to verses 26. We're going to read down to verse 31, and we're going to talk about April Fools. Okay? All right, here we are. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 says, For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Verse 27, But God has chosen the foolish things, underline that in your Bible, the foolish things of the world, to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. And verse 29 is really wraps it up. That no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth II, was once asked if 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31 troubled her regarding her salvation. Is there any hope for you, Queen, seeing that the scriptures teach that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called? And her answer was extremely insightful. The scripture teaches not many. It does not say not any. Okay? You and I are no different. Whether we're the queen of England or whether you've been delivered from the riverbed and ocean side or whether, you know what, you're here tonight, whatever your state is, Galatians 3, 26 says you and I basically are all on the same field. Amen. You've heard it said that at the foot of the cross, the ground is level. Every single one of us are different. But you know what? We all have the same salvation. It's the same God. And we all have different callings, but it's the same God who calls each one of us. And as I was thinking about what to speak tonight... It was actually wasn't so easy because I thought for sure that God would have me come and speak on something that's been going on in my life for a couple few weeks. And I thought I would share on that. God made it very clear that that was between me and him. And you know what? The things that he was doing were between me and him. And guess what? Did I just go, wow. I, I, I woke up the next morning after Pastor Kevin shared with me, told me I'd be teaching. I had no idea it was going to be my birthday. <laughs> I had no idea. I just know he said, guess what? You're teaching Friday. I appreciate Pastor Kevin because usually he tells me 10 minutes before I'm going to teach. <laughs> he gave me a little time. Right. <laughs> right? Don't we learn? Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you've been you turn for Christ, we've all learned that, guess what? You need to be ready in season and out. And so, you know, cruising around the world with Pastor Jerry, you know what I mean? And you got you to be ready because I remember going up the river in the Philippines like, okay, you know, you never know who's going to teach. You never know who's going to be on the radio. You never know who's going to be on the TV. And we're just over there. And every day was something new. And I just remember going up the river like, okay, you're on. I'm like, what am I going to what am I going to teach? And, and it's, we got to be ready because you know what? If you have, I like to say, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose, right? And if you can't tell people what your purpose is, then there's something wrong. And that's what I want to talk to you guys tonight about is callings. What's a calling? You know, what is it that you really like to do in this world? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit this from maybe two or three different angles maybe, okay? 
And so anyways, is a calling is something that, guess what, that God gives to every one of us. As a matter of fact, can I just ask you a question getting started here? What are you on this rock for, this round rock, right? Not flat rock. It ain't a square rock. It is the earth is round. Okay, so let's get that out of the way. Why are you on this earth? What are you here for? It's a, it's a really important question. Wouldn't you say? Why are we here? It's awesome, I'm telling you. And God wants to speak to each one of us, whether you're young, whether you're old, right? At least I'm not as old as Mary Jo. She's 75, I heard, man. You know, at least I ain't there yet, right? Or, yeah, I can't remember what 70 or 70 are, sorry. So, <laughs> anyways, you know. But it's, it's cool because I love God because you know what? He, he doesn't need guys and gals who got letters behind their name. Now, if you got a letter behind your name, I'm not disrespecting you. God saved the Queen of England. She was noble. She was wise. All that. So God does save noble, wise people. But he says in his word that he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, right? That's cool. So anyways, what is it in life that you cannot go without doing? You know, what is it, you know, some of the things maybe you're good at could be part of your calling, okay? It might not be because guess what? When God called me to pastor, I was saying, I can pastor, but there's a dual gift that's going on there. When they told me as pastor teacher, I'm like, not me. You wouldn't think that I am not a person who likes to get in front of people. I never, ever did homework in high school. So to sit for hours putting together studies is not my gift, I thought. I want to let you know that tonight... There might be something God's wanting to do in you, and it is not going to make no sense at all. You're going to go, this does not make any sense. And that's how it was with me. As a matter of fact, I tried to talk my pastor out of the teacher part of that dual gift. And then once I got ordained, I began to teach. And I started to find out that guess what? God would equip me. God will never call you without equipping you for whatever he calls you to do. A couple things to remember. Remember this. You're fearfully... And wonderfully made. You're uniquely made by God. That's Psalm 139. There's nobody like you on the face of the earth. You know, I used to have a weird, you know, thing with myself. I used to think, I go, you know, I am definitely eccentric and I'm definitely passionate. I'm definitely loud, you know. I got a lot of quirks, let's just say, right? I'm not your average Joe or whatever, right? And it used to bother me, I'll be honest with you. And then all of a sudden, as I start to walk with God, God starts saying, you know what? I want to use those quirks. I want to use those things that you don't really care about so much. And maybe some people have even made fun of you. I'm sure it's even happened in here. I, you know, people are like, dude, you talk a lot, right? I like to talk. I don't know why I like to talk. I don't like to be silent because talking, for some reason, you get to know people. With talking, you find out what people are made of. Talking is how God actually works in our lives. I don't even know that. He talks to us. God is a talker. And it's awesome. And so, you know what? Growing up being Steve Norgren, pretty tough, you know? Sometimes I feel like I feel like jumping out of my skin for crying out loud. It's just the way it is. I can't help that. It's awesome, actually. It really is. It's got to tame it. You know what I mean? It's called meekness, man. Strength is under control. You know, Ephesians... Chapter 2 has a wonderful verse there. I want to share it with you. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let me share with you what that verse is saying. I'm not a Greek scholar, but I love some Greek words. And this word here, workmanship, is an incredible word. It's this word that says that you and I are his poema, his workmanship. You know, I like rap music. I like hip hop. I like all kinds of music. Don't look at me weird, please, okay? I like every kind of music you can imagine. I even listen to bluegrass. Hey, let's move from Tennessee. Give me a break. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, I love hip hop. Let me tell you why. 
because it has rhyme and reason. Rhyming, I tell you, poetry is awesome, I'm telling you. God made you a poem. See, before the Lord, you and I don't have rhyme and reason in our life. As a matter of fact, we're like, it's like, it's like a bad poem, I'm telling you, our lives. Lord. And then what happens is when you and I all of a sudden give our life to Jesus Christ, our life becomes like a beautiful poem that God writes, and he uses your life, and he uses your gifts and your talents, and he uses all your quirks and all those things you don't like about yourself. He uses them for his glory and to edify the body of Christ. That's what he does, and so it's such a beautiful thing to know that, guess what? God is the one. God is the reason that we're the way we are. And I know, you know, when I was a teenager, I was just like you. I was a wannabe. I wanted to be somebody else. You always want to be like somebody, right? Don't you? Maybe you didn't. Maybe you didn't grow up like me. But you know what? As I would all of a sudden come to grow up and realize I wasn't going to be Snoop Doggy Dog. And, you know, I wasn't going to be, you know, James Hetfield and Metallica. You know, what? I mean, I mean, I hate to say it, I looked up to those guys. I mean, I looked up to Philip Rivers, too. Don't look, you know, think I'm that weird. I mean, I like Peyton Manning. Guys are... Guys I idol and think they're really great, you know, football players. Tom Brady, yes, I know he's better, but I don't like him, okay? So anyways, what goes on in your life is, is that God wants to use you just the way you are. You don't have to change to be used by the Lord. See, God does something as we will start to serve, as we will begin to do what he asks, right? Then he changes us along the way. It's a process called sanctification. You know, basically, as we take a look at some important definitions of maybe callings, I think of one, a job. I remember before I came to Utah for Christ, I had a job doing construction. And a job is something that you do to earn a living. A career is something that you do, you build to create your life. Many of us have built our lives around a career. That's good. A vocation is what God has you doing, something that will fulfill his highest calling in your life. Doesn't mean your career doesn't matter. Doesn't mean your job don't matter. It's just that God has made you and I certain gifts and talents that he wants to use yeah, and if you have a problem with your ears, you might not want to sit in the front row. I'm loud. I can't help it. I'm telling you. So anyway, I see two people going, <laughs> yeah, it's just the way it is. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, there's a, true, a couple of truths I want to share with you about callings. Okay? Calling, it's all yours and yours alone. My calling is different than your calling. Very different, whatever that might be. Your calling has your unique desires. God works your desires into that. And if your desires are wrong, we're going to talk about that, too, because there's a verse that shares that. So truth, you know, and I want to share it tonight. One of my favorite verses. I just love it right there. But your calling gives you strength, and it keeps you humble. If you've got a calling, it doesn't make you proud. It makes you humble. You go, wow, God. You use me in this way. It's like, it's such an incredible, incredible blessing to be able to know that the almighty God uses you and me for eternal purposes and things here in our families and, and in our, you know, communities here in, in Grants Pass. And, you know, I was just cruising around. I talk to people everywhere I go and just getting to know folks. It's actually, you know, it's Pretty neat area. I come from Tennessee, and it's been real friendly and nice. And when I first came here, I didn't think I'd experience that. I don't know what it was. I just, they're so nice out there, it scares you. <laughs> you know, they'll talk to you for an hour about nothing. <laughs> you know, it's just the way they are. You know, the sheep guy down the road talked to me for sheep for like an hour and a half. I'm going, he told me I did. Me knew every kind of sheep and what they did and everything. I knew all about them. It was like, and it was beautiful. Discovering your calling will... Sometimes happening in a moment, other times it will be an unfolding of time in your life. And maybe some of you here tonight are like me, maybe a little older, and you're going, I wonder what my calling is. And that's okay if you don't know. I hope tonight that maybe you'll get some wisdom here and 
And you'll get that because it don't make a difference. Like I said, Pastor Kevin says, as long as you got a, a pulse, you got a purpose. All of us do. It don't make a difference what age you are. I love young people. I really do. I love them because it's so neat to see them when they, it's just like a little plant tree, you know, like a like little pea bud, you know, the small things and young things and beautiful things like that. You know, they're going to grow up to be something beautiful, you know, and you hope they can bypass some of the stuff that we've had to go through, you know. I love teenagers. I just didn't like raising them. <laughs> you know, my daughter, man, she drove me crazy, you know, but, you know, I got an opportunity to raise teenagers again later on in my life. And like, I ain't got no hair. <laughs> they done got it all right. So, but anyways, no, but they're, they're awesome. And, and uh, they got so many questions and they think they know everything and, you know, and, and it's so neat because at that age, you can't learn anything when you're a teenager. But then you go ahead and you grow out of that and you spend the rest of your time, life learning that you don't really know anything, <laughs> you know. And for us that are older, we know it's like, wow, I really don't know all that much. There's so much more for us that God wants to show us. Pretty cool, man. So anyways, spiritual gifts. That's the one thing that, that works into callings. Spiritual gifts, Romans 12, 4, this is what it says. It says that we're many members in one body, but all the members not have the same function. Okay? This hand works much different than this foot. And my ear does a whole different thing than my eye does. And a good body, and I mean the body of Christ, it says that we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Do you realize you're part of the person on the other side of the room? And what you do over here, exercising gifts, blood, everybody else in the body. My eyes are working right now with my Ears and my eyes and my hands work. You just go ahead and tie up my hands. I can't talk. You know, my hands got to flop around. You know, I got to move. It's the way it is. And you know what? It's a beautiful thing. And it says, that, you know, since we have gifts that differ from one another, let's go ahead and use them. That's what Paul said. So your gift that you have here today is just as important. As a matter of fact, let me just get this out of the way. In my body are parts of my body that you don't see. I have a heart. I have lungs. I have things that you don't see that are very, very important. I got a brain I have somewhere up there, still there. Didn't fry it all out, right? But these parts that you don't see are more important than the ones that you do see. See, I can lose my hand. Almost lost my foot, right, Kev? Kev would tell me he prayed for me when my foot was turned around backwards uh, when I got in my motorcycle accident. I don't remember. I don't know why, but anyway, <laughs> I was in an ambulance, okay? So check this out. Is that, is that, you know, that is very important. I'm so glad that I could walk again. It took a long time, and, but my foot wasn't working for a long time. When you're not doing your share in the body of Christ, you know, everybody suffers, you understand? And there's some people here tonight, I guarantee you that, you know what, it, tonight's the night. It's like, say, you know what? Here I am, God. Here I am. I'm ready. It don't make a difference whether you're 14 or whether you're 40. 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is the other place you could find spiritual gifts. You want to look at the gifts later on, maybe you can find out what they are because they're spelled out. Paul did a really good job of spelling out what spiritual gifts are. Why? Because he wants the church to be operating in them. Okay? And there's, don't get scared of the gifts. Some of them have been abused, right? And so we get scared about them. But they're all spiritual gifts and they're all good and they're all for the edification of the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, 1, this is what it says. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, and I love that. When one of the writers write, they let us know who's being written to, not to an unbeliever. Why? Because the word brethren. I love scripture like that. Let's stop. So he's speaking to the body, he's saying, hey, guess what? I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual gifts, which would tell us that Obviously, there must be some kind of 
maybe ignorance that would go on with the spiritual gifts. And we see that in the church, don't we? Plenty of people are operating in a way outside of what the Bible would give for how spiritual gifts are supposed to operate. And because of it, we have a whole slew of people who are scared of spiritual gifts. Let's move on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you can read those chapters later, but it says there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. We all have the same spirit. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ here tonight. There are differences of ministries. You turn for Christ in Calvary Chapel, and whosoever's, and bikers for Christ, skaters for Christ, but it's the same Lord. Same God works in that. There are diversities of activities. We did some feeding here tonight. There was some food that was being handed out earlier today. There's teaching going on. Sometimes Greg will be doing worship here. There are different activities. We're getting ready to have a Easter showdown thing that's going to be awesome because I'm just hearing about all the different things that they're going to be doing. They're going to have like a, a, a obstacle course for the adults. I mean the kids. Uh, Pastor Kevin is going. To, yeah, he ain't allowed to. Um, but we're going to be having you know some evangelism going on. We're going to have a great message about you know the cross of Jesus Christ and what it means. We're going to have, you know, some times in the community out. And you guys can be involved in that because we have flyers that we would love to go and hand out at your jobs and your, and if you come from other churches or whatever, we don't want to take any from any other churches, but we do want to go ahead and uplift Christ. And we just want to hang out and have a great time celebrating the most, probably the most important thing that any Christian could celebrate. And that is the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 gives us some different kind of gifts. These are basically church gifts, okay? Specifically, he says that, you know what? And he himself, who's the Lord Jesus Christ, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry. This tells us what it's for, equipping that's what we want to be going on here in the pulpit. That's what we want to be going on when we serve. Everything we do should be equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Why? To edify the body of Christ. That means to build it up. That's what we want. We don't want to tear down, build up for the glory of God. Why? Till we all come to the unity of the faith. Isn't that a beautiful word? Unity. We have unity. It's awesome, man. We have a unity that, you know, one, one thing, I've been in Houston for Christ for a little bit and stuff like that. And one thing I noticed is crazy, man. God brings all kinds of different guys and gals. And it's just amazing how we all live together and we don't beat the tar out of each other. Now, you're sitting there laughing. You're going, well, why would you? Well, you don't know. We all come from different parts of the country, different parts of the world. We're all coming out of crazy backgrounds, most of us, except for me, you know. Uh, but anyways, um, but what goes on is, is that there's this beautiful unity that goes on. And when people will get in step with that, it's beautiful. These lives were just like totally racked and ravaged by sin. Then God begins to do a work. And all of a sudden, we just see people come alive. It's like, I'm not kidding you. You know, if you're not involved in YouTube or Christ, I'm letting you know, do it. I'm going to let you know right now. It's like the best, and I'm not giving a commercial. I am a U-Turn for Christ pastor. I'm also a Calvary Chapel pastor, but I tell you what, my U-Turn for Christ status, I, I will never, ever go against that. I just, I'm not kidding you, because it, can you imagine getting to watch guys and gals who basically were wrecked and ravaged, their lives were in shambles, and then all of a sudden you just watch them change. I mean, don't you love it when your kids change? Like, you hope they don't stay crazy feel all their life, right? Some of us takes 36 years till mama finally see me for one night before she died, see me actually get clean and sober and straightened out. My mom waited all those years. And now my family gets to experience that. Some of them are watching tonight probably and stuff and they're still going, he's the nut, you know, he's still crazy, you know, but it's my birthday, I can't help it. Born on April Fool's Day. 
Anyways, I like what David, you know, last words. You know, I like the last letter of Paul, 2 Timothy. Um, 2 Timothy actually is one of my favorite letters of Paul's. And it is my favorite letter of Paul, by far. And let me tell you why. Because you can feel the heart of a pastor who's getting ready to lose his life. And it's incredible, man. It's a swan song. And you just got, you can feel it. Now, you know, I'm a little emotional, man. And so, you know what? I can feel the emotion in 2 Timothy like no other of Paul writing of his writings. Now, you know what? The last words of David, here's another guy I liked. I like this dude, man. I really do. I like music. I love music. And so David wrote, man, you know, psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm. And we're going through them. I'm so excited about that because the book of Psalms is so sweet, man. It's awesome. It's filled with passion. This is what David said right before he died. He said, this says, these are the last words of David, the oracle of David's son of Jesse, the oracles of the man raised on high, the one anointed by the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel. Listen to this. The spirit of the Lord spoke through me. His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said to me, he who rules the people needs to rule with justice. And he who rules, rule in the fear of God. For us men who are in leadership, I gotta quit doing that. <laughs> okay, us, right? It's very important that we rule in humility and we rule in the fear of God because, see, we're gonna be held to a stricter judgment. And so we wanna make sure, when, are we perfect? Heck no. Just take a look at Pastor Kevin, man. Just kidding. <laughs> Just take a look at me, man. Take a look at any one of us. And you know what? If for some reason you might be one of those that are at the football game in the stands or in second phase shouting at the TV, the guy thought I was going to have a heart attack. He said, dude, you need to calm down. It's only a football game. If you're one of those ones that are in the stands trying to tell all of us that are trying to do, you know, we're trying to make the plays, man. We ain't making all the right plays, but we do do our best. Get down on the field. Some guys and gals here tonight need to get on the field. Don't be scared. You're going to make mistakes. And my son hated when I said this because I said it over and over again, but it's true. Michael Jordan missed more shots than he made, but he's remembered for the shots that he made. Keep shooting, people. Don't give up. God's going to use you just the way you are. Don't try to be somebody else. When it comes to your spiritual gifting or it comes to your calling, one thing that's worked in this is your heart. What are you passionate about? Are you passionate about football? Are you passionate about motorcycles? Join Bicycles of Christ or Christian Motorcycle Association. What is it that is your deepest desire? Well, you know what? I love elderly people. There are plenty of, you know, senior citizen homes. I don't know if they like that word or not. You know, living in a day where you got to watch what you say, right? Anyways, I'm going to be there soon, so I get to rule. I can say it all I want, okay? <laughs> Check it out. Do you like young people? Come serve in the children's ministry. Come serve in the youth ministry. If you have a passion for those that are locked up, prison ministry is awesome. It's awesome. I love it. One thing is, it's kind of like U-Turn for Christ. Your audience can't go nowhere. <laughs> they got to listen to you. I used to tell the guys at U-Turn, man, I go, yeah, you guys are the greatest audience in the world. You can't go nowhere. If you do, you get disciplined. Ah, right. Uh, anyways, <laughs> just kidding, okay? <laughs> but anyways, you know, what do you dream about? What is it that flicks your switch? Psalm 37, 4, delight thyself in thy Lord. Are you delighting in God today? If you are, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Now, okay, now look it. But I got a desire for some things that just ain't right. That ain't right. <laughs> right? Guess what? God will change your desires. Let's just say that you do want a jet airplane. And you want to fly all over the world and do whatever you want to do. God might not give you that jet airplane. But guess what? He could give you a Cessna. I like them better than jets anyways. 
You know, God sometimes has to change our desires because our desires don't line up with him. So what he'll do is he'll go ahead and change our desires from deep within. And all of a sudden, you'll start having desires that are godly. You'll start having desires for people. you start having desires to help. you start having a desire to, to do something. You'll just go, whoa, where does this come from? God. Right? Many of us come out of a really rough background. And, you know, it's, it's God just changed our heart, you know. So need to be rescued, redeemed, and restored. Have an you know, ability to, to have passions that are really cool, you know. There ain't nothing better than serving God, and that's what I'm hoping tonight here, to get you fired up about serving God. Not, not just knowing God. I know but most people probably know the Lord here. And if you don't, I'm going to give you an opportunity to meet the Lord. But if you do know the Lord, then serve God. And let me tell you why. Let me tell you why. Why, why would that be important? Because, you know, we might not stand in front of Almighty God and give an account for our sin at the great white throne judgment. But someday you and I are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ, called the Bema Seat of Christ. And at that point is we're going to give an account of what we did with the Lord Jesus Christ. What did you do? Did you tell people at your work? Did you help your kids to know the word? Did you, did your neighbors know you knew the Lord? And I'm not here to try to put a guilt trip on anybody. Please don't take it that way. I'm just trying to let you know is that hopefully, like I said, that we have some kind of passion for the people that are going to hell, man. It's a real place, people. It really is. And you know what? Nobody has to go there. That's the one thing about hell. Nobody needs to go there. And it's so simple to get to heaven. It's just to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God has raised him from the dead. And you'll be saved. It's so God made it so simple, even a child could be saved. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about calling, about heart, passion. Now, the next thing, how about abilities? You and I have basically strengths and natural gifts, and, and, and then you also have spiritual gifts, talents. What are you good at? But when you're dealing with abilities, be careful that you don't think too highly of yourself because God can always replace somebody. You understand? We've got to stay humble no matter what because it's all him anyways. None of us are born with these awesome spiritual gifts, but some of us have natural abilities. And those people that have natural abilities, you got to be careful because God said he'll share his glory with no man. Personality works into your gifting. How are you wired as it relates to other people? Are you an introvert, extrovert? What recharges your emotional battery? This gives me great passion sharing the word of God. I love it. I'm not kidding. I just dig it. It's been something that I've always liked since I've been teaching. And it does. It recharges my battery and gets me fired up. You know? I was talking to a brother this week, and we were talking about how different that we were. And he just doesn't really have like a like me and passion and all that. It's funny how God would put us together, kind of like your husband or wife, not like you. God does that for a reason. Well, anyways, my word for <laughs> Pastor Kevin is I got a jumper box out in my car. Fire him up. <laughs> I'll get you fired up, right? That'll give you some emotion, ah, right? <laughs> that's, that's what we want, though, when we're serving God is passion. Because if you take a look at Moses, he had passion, didn't he? Dude, he had to have passion to deal with three million knuckleheads, right? You ever think about that? David had passion, too, and stuff like that. Now, you know what? If you're, there are guys in scriptures that are very serious, and I think the apostle Paul was one of those guys. He's probably one of those kind of guys that, I mean, I love the heck out of this dude. You know, he'd be one of the first guys to go see in heaven. But you know what? You just take a look at this guy and go, this guy was intense, man. He was such an intense guy that he actually kicked somebody off the ministry team. Bye, and you ain't coming back again. Poor little Mark, right? Left him in the middle of the ministry, and Mark went on and obviously served with Peter, the Bible tells us. And guess what? He got restored to... Paul, years later, in the book of 2 Timothy, I love it so very much. He says, bring Mark to me. He's useful for me in ministry. And it speaks so loudly to people like myself who have been restored. You know, Mark blew it. He left. He gave up. He didn't, couldn't handle it. Whatever happened, you know. 
a lot of emotion, a lot of hardship, a lot of stuff. And you know what? And, and it, it gets to be real hard at times. Anybody who's in ministry, you know this, Michael and Butch and Pastor Kevin and anybody else, man. You guys know it's not for the faint hearted. It's not easy. That's why a lot of people don't want to do it. But man, it is the most glorious thing in the world to see guys that are in this ministry, and the guys aren't here tonight. I go, yeah, Kevin's smart. He keeps them away from me so they don't get, they don't catch my passion. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but anyways, you know what? I'm very, very serious in this point here. Is that your personality is the way God made you. There's no one else like you on the face of the earth. And you know, if you're totally chill and, and all that kind of stuff, I covet people like that. I really do. I used to want to be like Chuck Smith. I used to see him teach and please turn to the book of Revelation. And I'm like, oh, could I talk like that? That'd be awesome. No, I can't. I don't talk like that. Let's go to the book of Revelation. You know what I mean? It's just how I am. It's all right. God uses it. And you know what? It's, it's all right because, you know, experience plays into your calling. This is a one because Sometimes, you know what, we basically don't want to look at what we've done because it's all been bad, right? But, you know, if you have been doing a job for many, many years, right? Let's just say you build dams and you were working on the Hoover Dam. I got to see it this year. It was really cool, man, coming out here and seeing the Hoover Dam. Think about the person who helped build that. Think about the poor people that died that are in it. But anyways, uh, uh, think of the Hoover Dam. Somebody built that. And you know what? And then they go up to Washington and guess what? They got all that experience, and they can use that to help build the Grand Coulee Dam. You know what I mean? We put a high value on, on experience. It really is. It's nothing wrong with having experience. And so anyways, you know what? Basically, when you look at the rear view mirror of your life, what strengths do you have behind you? What things has God done? It's okay to do that, okay? Because when it comes to what he's called you to do, he might be using those things behind you and the experience that you and I have. It's so cool. You know, Paul would talk about forgetting those things which are behind and pressing on those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal for the upward call in Christ Jesus, right? We don't want to be looking in the rearview mirror when it comes to, you know, bad things or when it comes to things that, you know, that might hinder us from running well. Because if you notice, don't look around. Check it out at the Boston Marathon. They don't go sightseeing on, you know, sand, you know on, 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 the, on the beautiful sights. They're not looking around when they run. They look straight ahead. Why? Because it's not time for sightseeing. And you and I as runners, man, we need to be focused on one thing, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you know what? Is God wants to use us to go ahead and help other people to get in the race running. Runners don't ever look back. Hey, I wonder, you know, what's going on back there? That's when a guy starts to run or a girl starts running next to you, and pretty soon they're ahead of you. And then what happens? You start looking around because, oh, no, there's somebody ahead of me, or there's somebody behind me. Ha, <laughs> ha, look at me. I'm running fast. Look, mama. No hands, right? All those things are bad, bad, bad. But looking back and saying, hey, God, you have done an incredible work in my family. You've done an incredible work in my career. You've done an incredible work in my ministry. And I thank you, God, for all that you've done and allowed me to be a very small part of it, whatever it might be. So look back. Give God glory. So I go ready to land the plane here, as Pastor John Miller would say. I want to share some verses with you real quick. And just listen for a moment, if you would. I'm going to go through them. Just listen up and see if you can hear the voice of God here. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you, I knew you. Isaiah 44.2 says, I am the Lord who created you from your mother's womb. I will help you. Genesis 1.27, I created you in my own image. In the image of God, I created you male and female. 
Acts 17, 28, for in me you live and move and have your being. Psalm 139, 1, I have searched for you, known you. I know you're sitting down, you're rising up. I understand your thoughts are far off. I comprehend your path and you're lying down, and I'm acquainted with all your ways. Matthew 10, 30 says, I have numbered the very hairs of your head. It was easy with me. Therefore, do not fear. Romans 5, 8 says, for I demonstrated my love towards you, and that while you were still sinners, my son, Jesus, died for you. Romans 5.10 says this, so if when you thought that I was your enemy, I reconciled you through the death of my son, how much more now having been reconciled, you shall be saved by my son's life. In 2 Corinthians 8.9, for you know the grace of my son, that though he was rich, yet he was, became poor for your sake, and though his, through his poverty you might become rich, we're rich people. We're rich, man. Check this out. Psalm 139, 14. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Your very existence was not hidden from me, says the Lord. When I formed you in the secret place, when I assembled you in your mother's room, no one could see me at work. Nobody's seen God doing that little intricate work. James 1, 17. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In Jeremiah 29, 11, you all know, for I know the plans I have for you. They're plans of good, not evil, to give you a future and a hope. In Jeremiah 31, 3 says, yeah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And by my love, I invite you to be with me forever. Jeremiah 29, 13, if you decide to seek me, you'll find me. And guess what? You will. And then lastly here tonight... My life verse, Ephesians 3.20, Lind Road. I want to do for you exceedingly abundantly more than you could ask or think by the power that works in you. Are you going to let God do an exceeding abundant work in you tonight? And walk out of this room different than you came in. That's always our heart. Is that somehow or another, we just wouldn't come in here and we wouldn't walk out different. We ain't got time, man, to go ahead and for some reason not respond to what God wants to do. I don't know if there's anybody in here who doesn't know the Lord. If you don't, you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, nothing to be scared of. He loves you. He brought you here to tell you, I got a plan for you. There ain't nothing better, I'm telling you, man. You cannot beat this deal. He says, I'll forgive her every one of your sins, past, present, and future. Right? I mean, I'll forget everything you've ever done. I'll place my spirit in you as a down payment so you can go to and be with me forever. I mean, where are you going to get a better deal than that? You know what I mean? This almighty God that created everything and everybody loves us so much that wants to be with us forever. And we're the only ones that can keep that from happening. So if that's you and you know you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, we're not going to put you on front street. Come talk to Pastor Kevin. And if you want to step forward up here and Pastor Don, maybe we'll just have some guys up here for prayer tonight. You know, let me go ahead and give the second part of this call, this call here tonight. Yeah, you guys can come up if you want. It says, you know, t tonight. Wow. Can you really use me, God? Is there really something that you have for me to do? Yes, he does. He does. Now, you know what? I guarantee you that as you come talk to Pastor Kevin or Pastor Don, myself or Linda, you can talk to Michael, you can talk to any one of us, we'll tell you. But what I'm getting at is, is that, you know what? God wants you to be used. Go out of here tonight and somehow or another and give a call or let one of us know. You know what? We love to say, yeah. Come help out at the, you know, handing out food on a Friday or come work in the children's ministry. You know what I mean? Come and hang out here and serve food. You know, man, I'll tell you what, man, we love to have any one of you that wants to help out. Man, we just, we just would just love it, man. It would make us just go, yes. And then there's some people here, I guess what, we know you're from another church maybe and all that. And that's, that's cool. We're not trying to. Uh, you know, we're not trying to steal anybody here. We appreciate all the works that are going on here and stuff like that. But come visit us whenever you can. We love visitors, man. We really do. So, and you know what? L come invite us because we would love to come visit where you're at, too. The neat thing to be able to go and see the different fellowships in town and all that. Amen? Amen. 
Cool. Lord, we thank you. And God, I pray as you're just moving by your spirit, God, you just uh, draw. Draw people to yourself. Lord, show us that you're not done with us. Lord, you're just getting started. You're a mighty God. Lord, your eyes go to and fro over all the earth, looking for a man or a woman you could show yourself strong and who has a heart loyal towards you. And God, I pray if there's anything that's holding any of us back, whatever it might be, we know the enemy's always at work trying to and discourage us, disqualify us, Lord. And uh, so I just pray if anybody's feeling inadequate, man, they would know, welcome to the club. <laughs> we all feel so inadequate for such a beautiful, beautiful, you know, thing we get to do, whatever it might be, you know. Just need to be able to know that there's a God in heaven who truly is really lead guiding and directing. And so thank you so much for an opportunity for me to be able to share tonight. And uh, God, I pray you'd bless your people, Lord, with joy and peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Right. Amen.